Well, like one of the things that happens in this work is people get easily depleted. You know, it, you're working with people who are in pain and struggling all the time. How do you, which is the hard part, how do you be a compassionate presence for hour after hour, day after day, week after week, for years? How do you do that without becoming numb or resentful or even more distant or not being available to your family, to your loved ones? So I call that recharging. How do you recharge your psychological, spiritual values? I use a phrase, which is a Celtic phrase in Gaelic called Anam Kara. Anam is soul, Kara is friend. So part of what I'm doing is encouraging therapists to be a soul friend to their clients. I also encourage people to think about their relationship as a sanctuary. Think of the office space that we have, that the, the, the actual space in which we work that creates a sense of safety, a, a refuge from the, the struggles of the outside world. Each of us then needs to be able to answer that question about why am I better at taking care of other people and not good at taking care of me? Most of us will need to look at that question in individual therapy, and I highly recommend that. A couple of pathways of that that I've found from my own life, from supervisees, from people who I've had as patients who are counselors, therapists. One is that, and it's common with male therapists, is that no of the men in their lives, particularly their fathers, modeled taking care of themselves. It's not something that they've witnessed as a pathway, and so that they don't have any mentorship or modeling in that. And so I, in those circumstances, I tell my story and offer um, the struggles I've had with that and how I've worked through that as a modeling for them. This is a role that we've been in much of our lives, that we had some role in our family of being either a physical or emotional caretaker. For example, in my life, I was the emotional caretaker of my mother, who was an anxious person, who was struggling to deal with the issues of my alcoholic father. And so um, I was her emotional caretaker. And that gave me a lot of self-esteem, a lot of praise from her, a lot of love. And I experienced that with many of the therapists that I've counseled, where they had a similar kind of role in their family. There was some sense of special status, some sources of self-esteem, some source of parental approval, love, that came from that. So then, if they start to think about, like, maybe taking better care of themselves, they start to worry at a deep level, there's a fear, maybe people won't love me. Maybe that the approval that I'm used to getting won't happen to me if I start to do these things to take care of myself. Maybe they'll think I'm selfish. And so there's a working through of that kind of process that needs to happen. What are some of the pathways that are really very good for counselors, therapists, pastoral counselors, life coaches, as a way of recharging. So one of the things I find is that it's very important to spend time every week with only yourself. That to be away from any person that might have any need from you whatsoever. Because the nature of our personalities is that if we're with somebody else, we're going to be thinking about their needs and try to take care of them. That's what we do. So uh, one of the solutions for that is to take time just by yourself. 
So, for example, what I do every week is at least once a week, some weeks twice, I go for an hour and a half, two-hour walk out in a local nature setting. So that's the solitary thing that I do. I have other folks who do various things. I have a friend of mine who rides his motorcycle. I have another who does horseback riding. I have another who just cooks meals for himself. I also recommend having situations where somebody takes care of you, usually around food. Like one of the things I do every week is I go out at least once, sometimes twice, for lunch by myself. So then I think of this person is taking care of me. And the symbolism of food as a form of psychological nurturance is important. I also encourage people then to do something with others. But other, the other you go to, you're doing something that's playful. <laughs> Not <clears throat> where you're going to have some serious conversation, but rather to do something that's fun. So that the other person that you go with, or persons that you go with, I think of then as playmates. Um, and we're playing together. So what I do is like, I'm a big fan of college basketball and jazz. I have a friend of mine who loves the same things. We go out to basketball games together. We go to jazz gigs together and have a good old time. We're having fun. He's my playmate. I know some other people that... They have a weekly poker game. Okay. Some people get together and they do community theater. Some, a couple of people who do street busking, who are therapists. My, my wife, Jean, what she does is she has a studio. And what she does, nobody can get in touch with her where she's in her studio. And she's there doing her creative artwork. How do you recharge yourself during sessions? There's a big challenge. Here, you're in the energy field of the person who's in pain, some kind of suffering. That's in the room. It's palpable. If you're really opening your heart up, their fearfulness, their sadness, their angst, their emptiness, it's right here between you. And it's going to start to kind of come into your consciousness, into the vibrational energy field of your consciousness. It's, and will go inside of you, and then you carry that on to the next person, and the next person, and the next person, or carry it out of the office. How do you not carry that? How does that not get inside of you? Because I think that this is also one of the reasons why a number of therapists over a period of time become more emotionally distant. is because they're in the energy field of so much of it, the only way they can protect themselves from, the, from carrying it is to back up. It's the, and they'll say they're being professional. But really, whether it's an act of self understandable act of self-protection, because nobody's taught them, how do you be in the energy field of that? kind of suffering, and not let it get into you. So what I've done over a period of time, and nobody taught me this one, I better work this out on my own, and that's why I'm trying to pass it on, is that I have, a, um, right behind the patient chair in my office, I have a, a painting of a lake, of a beautiful Taoist painting of a lake, and that, when I think of that, I think of serenity and peacefulness. And it, I have a pond that's near me that's just like that. So I, when I, with a patient, I look at that, especially when somebody's fearful, I look at it and I think of how it feels for me to be in that place and how it's recharging. So then I'm thinking about that, I look at it, And I do this breathing. With the out breath, I'm releasing the 
fearfulness that the other has. I also have in my office behind the patient chair on this side over here, I have a, a, a wooden carving of um, my higher, my image of my higher self. It's this bearded old man that's a profound source of compassion and has a deeper compassion and bigger heart than my ordinary heart. And so when I'm in the energy field of someone who's really struggling with profound sadness and depression, I look at that image and I try to open myself to that larger heart of mine by looking at it. And again, I'll look at it, just glance at it, and again go, So I'm taking in and connecting to my higher self, which is, has a bigger heart than mine. And I'm letting go of the sadness, letting go of the depression, letting go of the angst that is in the energy space between me and my client. So I'm doing that. And also another corner of my office, I have a large poster of a giant redwood that a patient gave me when they fin he finished therapy. And it's there. And whenever I feel like very tired and depleted because it's the work is tiring, I look over and I think of this thing that this tree that's been around for a couple of thousand years. And it, for me, it symbolizes strength and stamina and reliability. So I look at it. And again... taking in that, the energy, and also the memory for myself of being among the redwoods. The memory of myself of walking in the woods and what it feels like to recharge myself by walking among the, the big trees near my, in my community. So then I'm remembering that experience and drawing from it inside myself and releasing the tiredness, releasing the sense of depletion and fears of not having enough stamina. Doing these things during sessions has been a remarkably helpful thing for me. Most of the time when I finish my morning's work and I've seen four patients, so I've spent four hours, I'm not tired. And I don't feel depleted nor do I feel resentful or detached. I feel like I've been compassionately present. And then I can go take a break and I know that I now have some, some way, some method of recharging myself even during sessions. Wow. So I'd like to pass that on and maybe you can find a way similar to what I have that works for you. Thank mm -hmm. you.